Greetings. If you're here watching this video, it's because you have some interest in either my university, my department, or my programs. So let's get started. Greetings, incoming graduate students. My name is Dr. Terry Orsi. I am an assistant professor and the graduate and Seaburn defense director in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. On behalf of the faculty, staff, and students at Wright State University, Boonshaw School of Medicine, I am here to officially welcome you to the program. COVID-19 has impacted the world, and this includes how we do orientation. Today, we're going to share with you an aerial view of the campus, the tracks, concentrations, and certificates the program currently offers. And as a special treat, a few of the faculty have created short videos telling you about the classes they teach and their research. If, at the end of this presentation, you still have questions, you need only email a member of the team. If that voice sounded familiar, it should, because that was me. Hello, I'm Terry Orzi, Dr. Orzi, and now I'm going to show you an aerial view of our beautiful campus. Now you may wonder why you would want to move to some place called Dayton, Ohio. Many of you have probably never even heard of Dayton, Ohio. So let me tell you some of the things that the students say um, when we've asked them that questions. Now the number one answer is the cost of living. Compared to other places, living in Dayton, Ohio is really reasonable. Um, an average apartment to rent is maybe $500. You can get a, get away with spending two hundred to three hundred dollars for groceries. It really is a place that you can live. You can live here without a vehicle. Uh, the campus, there's many stores close by, and I think you'll really enjoy it. But don't take my word word for it. Please reach out to some of our students. Get on our social media pages. And, and talk to them and find out what drew them to our campus. But first, let me tell you a little bit about our students. So this is the class of 2020. These are the students that started this fall. Uh, it is a small class. Typically, we have approximately 30 students coming in each semester, or rather fall semester. Um, but not this year, it, it's a little bit smaller, but we do plan on taking several students in the spring, which is unusual for us. Now our students end up in a variety of places. They, some of them go on and get a PhD, some of them decide to work um, in industry. Now, because we are a STEM school, OPT for our students can be three years. And the primary place they go is Cincinnati Children's Hospital, which is just an hour south of us. We do have, like I said, many students going to a variety of places. There you see another student on this page, Mina, who's at Children's uh, Hospital in Cincinnati. 
you can see here uh, we have students um, at Columbus Children's Hospital, far away is New Jersey, Fort Wayne, Indiana, which is not very far. Uh, Jeremiah is working on a pharmacy degree. And then we have a student that is now a postdoc um, at Washington University in St. Louis. So uh, we have quite a few other students, New Jersey, Kalamazoo, Karasaurus. Now Dixius was a great student. He ended up taking more classes than he had to take. And that gave him, gave him an opportunity that when he finished his OPT to be hired on full-time at CareSource. Now, I mentioned that in Dayton, Ohio, Wright State University may not be well known, but that does not stop our students from going to, to wonderful um, universities beyond, like University of Iowa and many others. I'm just scrolling through here. Um, oh, let me tell you a bit about Namika. Namika, his nickname was Sykes. Namika once came to me and said, the problem with our program is we had too many options. He, he wanted to take all the classes and he was just overwhelmed with how, how many choices. And I have to ask, do you think that would be a bad problem if you had so many choices to choose from? Because I don't think it's a problem. Uh, here we have another one that's um, Dan Baker. Uh, he's a chief toxicologist in Columbus, which is about an hour northeast. We have Artie, who is now a postdoc at Harvard. Uh, Captain Robert, um, is he was in Korea, and I believe he's just been recently stationed in Washington State. We have Robert. Robert was, he came in to do our CBRN program and stayed to do our master's program. Jerry and Jude are both MD students working on their MS. And here are some of the students. You can see Namika's on here, um, quite a few others. Now, what happens is, to my delight, I must say, is the students reach out to me when they graduate and join um, join me on LinkedIn. So I'm able to keep in touch with, with them and, and see where they are, even, you know, 10 years. I remember when Kasha was a student of ours, and now he's been at Ohio State Medical Center for 10 years. It's amazing. But we do have things we have to cover, so let's go ahead and go to the welcome folders. Here we go. So you can see down below um, in just a minute, our faculty and staff, because you know they're the, the, they're the ones that are going to get you where you need to go. And you can see this is Dr. G. Bill, Dr. Young Feng Chan, Dr. David Kuhl, Dr. Mauricio DeFavio, Dr. Halid El Asad, Dr. Sabir Hussein, Dr. Michael Kemp, that's me, Dr. Craig Rohan, Dr. Ravi Sahu, Dr. Courtney Salentic, Dr. Young Zhong Yu Zhu, Dr. Tom Lockhart, Dr. <laughs> they're going too fast for me, Dr. Norma, Dr. Peter, Dr. Jim Lucott, uh, Kelly Williams, Major Kelly Williams, um, Dr. Macopoulos, Dr. Trevor Bill, Dr. David Ellis. Now some of our staff, uh, I'll be bringing them up, them up in the next slide, so let me just continue. Here we have Dr. Jeffrey Travers. He is the chair of the department. There I am again, Dr. Terry Orsi. Then we have Catherine Winslow. She is the assistant to the uh, chair as well as the assistant director of the master's program. That means she's pretty much the most powerful person in the department. And then we have Corinne. Corinne just joined us about two weeks before we shut down for COVID. So we haven't really got to spend a lot of face-to-face -face time together, but she's amazing. And then Barbara Albright, she's our admin specialist. So that's the team that brings the students in and gets them started on the path. Now let me tell you a little bit about our program. Our program started in 2001 with just a research track and we had three students joining us at that time. 
In 2009, we started a non-thesis track, and I think we were up to 20 students by then. 2012, we started the CBRN Defense Program. That's Chemical, Biological, Radiological, Nuclear Defense Program. Um, I started this because my background is um, military. 2014, we rebranded the non-thesis track into a leader admin track, which meant we we started several new courses that would give students a uh, a, a chance to get a job in a leadership role, administrative role, with some business experience. 2015, we started the MDMS concentration for medical students. 2018, we created a one-year online track. Let me tell you, that was really beneficial with COVID and in uh, 2020 in um, April when we went online. 2019, we had to redo the MDMS concentration because the medical school curriculum changed. And in 2020, we started the clinical trials coordination concentration. Now that track just started in fall of 2020. We also have just got approval for a clinical trials coordination certificate, and we are working on a new concentration called healthcare and Homeland Security. Now, um, as I mentioned, we have these tracks. We have a five semester track, research track, four semester leader admin track, two semester leader admin track, and a online leader admin track. Now this is the research track and the students do this in a cohort fashion. That means they all take the, the classes together. This helps keep the students on track so they finish when they need to finish. The four semester leader admin track, it is also a cohort system, but you can see you get to choose a few different electives and that's done your second year. Now this one may be the most challenging because you're taking all of the classes which equal up to 30 credit hours in two semesters. So approximately 15 credit hours per semester. However, it is possible and we have several students that do this. And then our last track and that is the online track. And you can see there are a few differences here. We have classes that are only for online students. Now I mentioned the electives and there are quite a few electives. But first, we did change the program of study for spring because as I mentioned before, we have some students starting in the spring and we typically do not. So we wanted to, to make sure that by, we, by the time fall comes around that they're on track. So we've changed things up a bit. So if you are interested in joining us, just um, go online and look at the classes or reach out to one of, one of the members of the team. These are, this is a close-up of the classes and how they changed. Now this shows uh, the different tracks. Um, so I'm comparing the research track to the leader admin tracks. So obviously five semesters for the research track. You can finish the leader admin track in two semesters minimum. Uh, the MS degree is, is the designated degree for both tracks. There's no distinction on your, on your degree. Uh, in, on average, when we're not in a COVID state, students spend at least nine to five Monday through Friday in the laboratory taking breaks to go to classes, whereas leader admin track students have the option to spend time in a laboratory and do some research, but typically they only are on campus when they are in court taking classes or when we have uh, seminars. Students have to complete a thesis under the research track. They have to complete a publishable review paper if they're in the leader admin track. For the research track, students work one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member on a research project. For leader admin, they work one-on-one -on -one with a faculty member on a review article. 
research track, the students take fewer electives, leader admin track, more opportunities to get certificates because they take more electives. In both tracks, seminar attendance is required. So now we have the concentrations. We have the clinical investigation concentration. And as I mentioned, that is for the MD students, the medical students, because courses are, are um, substituted be, uh, be based off the courses they're taking in the medical school. But the clinical trials track, which is the next one, it's a two semester track. Let's zoom in here. And these are the course, courses they take. This is for healthcare professionals. So you need not be a hard scientist to take these courses. You will spend 40 hours in a clinical trials unit learning, uh, learning the learning everything you need to know about being a clinical trials coordinator. And finally, this is the list of electives. This list is ever changing based off of feedback from students and just what is needed. Um, as you can see here, we have this, well, let's just go to this one. We have the leader admin track, the good laboratory practices and the human studies, leader admin track. The leadership theory and application course, which by the way, is a class I teach and it's my favorite class to teach. So if you come here, join it, take this class. Um, all three of those, give you an, a department certificate indicating the contact hours you spend in those courses. Now, we also have graduate certificates and that does show up on your transcripts. We have the three there, the Med Chem Rad Nuke Defense, Med Bio Defense, Case Studies, that it gives you a graduate certificate. And then we have two nationally identified certificates, Six Sigma Green Belt and Six Sigma Black Belt. So now let's go here, oh, no, let's come down here. I wanna show you this a little bit more. Uh, this is the Seaburn Defense Certificate Program, and these are the three classes I just mentioned that you take. Now, the, the person you wanna contact if you decide to take those classes and learn more would be Kelly Williams. This is Major Kelly Williams. He has been doing CBRN for the Army for several years. And he has, I think, to date, over 70 certificates related to CBRN training, CBRN training. It's pretty amazing, isn't it? Okay, so let's just see what we have here on the laptop. This is how you access Wings and Pilot. Wings, well, let's just show the video. Let's see if the video can keep up with me. So here's the Wright State homepage and pilot and wings, pilot and wings. We're named after the Wright brothers, the first in flight, so you can see where the pilot and the wings come from. So we are, um, you know, aware of security, so you have to log in. Two-factor authentication. And now you're on wings. You can access Pilot from here. You get to find out everything that's happening on campus. You add classes, you can order books, you can go to Pilot. Now here we're on Pilot. Now this is my page, as you can see over here. And so you, when you scroll down, you can see that you can pick what classes you have depending on the semester. So this is 2020 fall. This was before the classes were activated. So you can see I have quite a few classes. Not all faculty use Pilot for the classes. So if you have a question, if you don't see a class on there, just reach out to your, to your professor. You can also go to our libraries through this. You can get help. If you do not know how to use anything, you can do quite a few different tutorials. And that's it. So you now know how to find wings and you know how to find pilot, but you do not yet know how to find Boonshoff School of Medicine on the web. So let's take a look. 
Here we are. This is Boonshoff School of Medicine webpage. If you go under Departments, Centers, and Offices and scroll down under Academic Departments, you will find Pharmacology and Toxicology. And then under the Pharmacology and Toxicology page, you can get a variety of information like program information, educational programs, where you can see uh, what is pharmacology, what is toxicology, the, the tracks we have, the concentrations, eligibility requirements for the program, certificate programs, fees, international applicants. Scroll back up and you can see additional application information. If that was not enough, you can go to this page and learn exactly what you need to do to apply. And that's it, pretty easy. What it does not tell you is, that's our, our staff and faculty, um, what it does not tell you is about the $1,000 scholarship that all of our students get on their first semester. And there are other scholarship programs as well. Um, the UCIE, our international education, is currently running a special scholarship based off of GPAs. We typically have once, uh, once a year, we have scholarships that the students can compete for. And there are others, I cannot name them all, but please go to our website, go to the UCIE website, uh, go to Wright State's website to learn more. Okay, now on to our social media sites. We have, this is just our Facebook. We do have Twitter, but I'm just showing you Facebook in this um, video. You can see, you can, you can find us elsewhere. Corinne is the one that handles that. You met Corinne a few slides ago. So here we have our department page. We have over 4,000 likes. And then we have our grad student page, it's the Medical Research Club, and our CBRN Defense page. All of them are pretty active. So please join us. I mentioned the Medical Research Club. It is a club that's open to all science students. However, because it is housed in our department, only our graduate students can be officers in the club. And so what you have here is just showing you the four uh, officers. Now this changes as officers graduate. I mentioned that students must attend seminars and the, the seminars right now are happening online through WebEx. However, this could change and we could go back to face-to-face -face next fall, uh, but we'll just have to wait and see. You are also, students rather, are also encouraged to attend thesis defenses, PhD defenses, and anything that will help you network and get to know more about the work that is happening at the university and beyond. So that's it with our social media. And I'm looking over the screen and I think you have everything with the exception of the Farm Talks faculty photos. So let's just come over here. Now, um, you saw this briefly on the last video. You see these are our faculty. We have our fully affiliated faculty. We have our adjuncts, our retired um, emeritus faculty. So quite a few. This is handy. This is good information if you say want to reach out to one of the faculty and learn more about their research. A couple more. Uh, John, Jonathan Hamilton, he teaches for us a communications and science class. He is a, uh, he works for National Public Radio, NPR. We have Kelly Williams, I mentioned him. He's at the bottom of this list. He is the one that teaches the CBRN programs. Dr. Karen Mumi, she is the 
branch, the head of the NAMRU, the Navy Medical Unit um, at Wright Pat Air Force Base. We have quite a few relationships, adjuncts and partnerships with the military base next door. So now what you see in front of you are some of our faculty talking about either their research or the courses they teach or both. So we have five of them here. Two of them are visible. The three below you will see when we get to them. So let's start with Dr. Mike Kemp. Hi, my name is Michael Kemp. I'm an assistant professor here in the Farm Talks Department at Wright State. And so I thought I would share a little bit about what I do here. So, uh, my research interests are in the area of DNA damage and DNA repair, and specifically uh, something we refer to as bulky DNA addicts. Um, a classical example of this is uh, UV wavelengths of sunlight, uh, which can induce thymine dimers in their DNA. We know that these can be mutagenic and lead to things like skin cancer. However, we're exposed to a number of other compounds and carcinogens in the environment and in our diets that also generate bulky DNA addicts that can lead to other, a wide variety of other types of cancers. So we often think of DNA damage in, in negative terms. However, we often use DNA damage agents, uh, such as uh, a classical example is cisplatin, generates addicts and DNA that uh, can help kill cancer cells. So uh, DNA damage can both cause disease and be used to treat human disease. So in my lab, we're interested in something known as the cellular DNA damage response. Um, we, we, we approach this issue, this field, in, in two main areas. One is, uh, again, coming back to UV light in human skin. And our interests are specifically developing new and better methods for measuring uh, the DNA damage response in human skin. Then to apply these for specific uh, purposes and in specific patient populations. And one of the, the major uh, projects currently in, in best being looked at in the lab is, is comparing the DNA damage response in young adult skin versus geriatric skin. Since we know older individuals are at higher risk of skin cancer, is this due to normal uh, DNA damage responses. A second major focus in the lab is, is on cancer chemotherapeutics. And in this topic, we're, uh, one of our major interests is in a, a protein kinase known as ATR that is known to be a global regulator of the DNA damage response in both normal and cancer cells. So we're trying to understand what ATR function is in that context. Um, a, a more recent project is to look at uh, using drugs that can manipulate and modulate the body's circadian clock to potentially improve the effectiveness and limit the toxicity of DNA damage and cancer drugs. And both of these, these projects are currently funded by the NIH and the Ohio Cancer Research Associates. So we use a variety of experimental systems in the lab, ranging from in vitro protein biochemistry to uh, quite a bit of, of human cell culture. And then we also use actually discarded human uh, abdominal plastic skin for a number of types of studies. And when appropriate, we use mouse models. And then we also uh, use human subjects research. And so we, we will often uh, or occasionally take uh, skin punch biopsies from defined populations of people for, for our work. Uh, my laboratory is, is, is located in the Biological Sciences Building. I have a number of researchers actively working uh, currently. We have a, one, a one postdoc, a one PhD student, and then currently three uh, uh, students in the Farm Talks Master's uh, program doing their thesis work. I also do some teaching for the department. Uh, within In the fall semester, I teach a one uh, credit hour career planning course where we, we look at the different types of opportunities that are available for the people in this field and then work to help students uh, try to identify ways to potentially reach that next step once they're done here at Wright State. I'm um, in the spring. I teach a, a course entitled Pharmacology and Toxicology of DNA Damaging Agents. Again, this is really focused sort of on my background, research background, and my interests. Um, and this looks at, uh, this work looks, this course looks at uh, the wide variety of DNA damaging agents we're exposed to, their impacts on, on cells, how cells respond, and then how these, uh, uh, these compounds can potentially impact human disease and treatment. Um, with that, um, my contact information is listed here. I'd be happy to, to meet one-on-one -on -one with, with people um, and to discuss uh, my interests. In, in Thank you, Dr. Kemp. And now we have Dr. David Ellis. Hello. I am Dr. David Ellis and I am adjunct faculty at Wright State in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, and I'm a research toxicologist with the Navy Medical Research Unit at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. 
I teach Introduction to Cell Biology, PTX6002, which is fully online and designed for you to complete on your own schedule. I also teach a online journal club, PTX7002, which discusses pharmacogenomics. And it's also fully online and designed for you to complete on your own schedule. I hope that each of you has a wonderful experience, a positive experience at the Boonshoff School of Medicine and Wright State University, and I look forward to seeing each of you in my classes. Thank you, Dr. Ellis. Now we have G. Bill. Hi, everybody. This is Dr. G. Bill from the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology. First of all, welcome to Wright State University. Today, I would like to briefly introduce my research area that we have been doing and maybe we will be doing in the future. Um, so my research uh, basically and the transnational project in the vascular disease area. It includes several vascular disease with focus on the strokes, ischemic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke and also the diabetes-related vascular complications and stem cell therapy with focus on endocellular progenitor cells as well as heart area recently in the microvesicle and the exosome. So the ischemic stroke is occlusion of blood vessels so behind the blood to the brain or in the brain. So we have an animal model to induce ischemic stroke in the mouse by doing the middle cerebral artery occlusion. After the surgery, we can record the cerebral blood flow and we can also do all sorts of immunofluorescence scanning to measure the infect value like the stroke size and as well as the endogenesis. For the hemorrhagic stroke, is different from the ischemic stroke is the rupture of the blood vessel in the brain to cause bleeding in the brain and then leading to the urological dysfunction. The animal model we are using in our lab is the micro-injection of the collagenase to induce hemorrhagic stroke. With the microvesicle and exosomes, there are two different types of extracellular vesicles released from the cells. We are focusing on investigate their biomarker role in the vascular disease area as well as in diabetes and also the UVB induced skin injury. We are also interested in their functions. They are not only a biomarker, but they also could be functional because they carry all sorts of molecules including proteins, microRNAs and the messenger RNAs. So we are interested in to see the function of the endocellular progen to cell release exosomes in the vascular disease area such as stroke, also in the diabetic complications, as well as the UV radiation induced skin injuries. This is our collaborative project with our chair, Dr. Travers, to see the role of the microparticle in the UVB reduced induced skin injury so currently we have two master students in my lab one of the students is going to defend this summer her project is actually in the role or effect of the exercise in the exosome release as well as information in the adipose tissue the other student's project is on the endocellular project cell release exosomes in protect the neurons from the hypoxia injury. So right now we are doing it actually because of the pand pandemic effect. So we are focusing on writing a review article together, then she will go back to lab and doing her project. But this is all about my research area, maybe not all partially. If you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bill. Oh, look, it's me. <laughs> I don't look very happy, do I? 
Too often we see people with advanced degrees and leadership roles without any training. A college degree alone does not give you the skills to work effectively with people. My leadership credentials, a year and a half meeting with an executive coach, a doctorate degree in organizational studies leadership track, Boonshaf School of Medicine Leadership Academy, FBI Leadership Academy, a postdoc at the VA in the Simulation Center training physicians and healthcare professionals. I have provided people in military, industry, academics, and government leadership workshops playing the same games we do in the classroom. This leads me to talk with you about my course, Leadership Theory and Application. The students are responsible for reading two books, Primal Leadership and Crucial Conversations. A weekly assignment consists of the student reflecting on the chapters they read and writing about how this lesson plays out in their own life experiences. The classroom portion of the class is where the fun happens. We meet eight times over the semester and role play. The first meeting gives the students a chance to find out if they have any leadership skills and where they can improve. This is called 456 Power Platform. The next meetings include elevator speeches, meeting behaviors, verbal and nonverbal communication. They have practice giving people bad news. And a fair amount of time in the classroom is dedicated to writing and proving your curriculum vitae. The biggest complaint from outside the classroom is that we're having too much fun laughing. And from the students in the class, they want more face-to-face -face meetings. Last spring, the, the students were not ready to have class over, so we continued to meet a few weeks into the summer. It's a three credit hour class and may be your only chance to learn to be a great leader. Why would you want to miss such an opportunity? But wait, there's more. I'm also, also responsible for the human studies class, a must for any scientist interested in clinical work. It is a simple class that's packed full of goodness. Students go to the CITI, pronounced city, training site, and after a question answer session, they are given a series of modules to read and are tested on. If they get an 80% or greater, a certificate is generated. This is a national website, and everyone in the country doing human studies must do training on this site. Only they don't get credit for it like you will. You will complete five modules and upload a copy of your certificates for the grade. You must also complete a human studies petition. The purpose of this assignment is to make you familiar with human studies, but if you want to submit your petition to the university IIR board, excuse me, IRB board, you should. Lastly, you must answer a few questions on the discussion board. As I said, simple class. Both of these classes give you new sections for your curriculum vitae. Our department cares about you and your career, not just you in the classroom. So you will find that many professors are often reminding you to add this or that to your CV. And this is why we offer classes like Human Studies, Leadership, Career Planning, GLP, Lab Management, and more. Thanks, and I will see you soon. Hello everyone, my name is Dr. Ravi Sahu. I'm an assistant professor in the Department of Pharmacology and Toxicology, Bone Shop School of Medicine, Allied State University. My research has been focused on various aspects of cancer and cancer therapies. In particular, my lab has been interested in exploring the translational relevance of phospholipid mediated base signaling pathways. So the areas of translational research studies that we do in the lab are to define the role and mechanisms of environmental carcinogen such as ultraviolet B radiation, various pollutants, as well as various therapeutic agents like radiation therapy, chemotherapeutic agents, targeted therapy, and immunotherapy responses. So why, and these projects are very significant because we all know that we have been exposed in our daily life either to environmental carcinogen or various pollutants. The chronic exposure has been shown to be associated with various adverse effects. And also, one of the major challenges that the cancer researchers they are trying to, uh, to address is how to increase the efficacy of cancer therapy, which is uh, due to the effect of tumor resistance mechanism. And radioactivating factor pathway 
has been involved in in these in these events so what we have shown over time is that all these agents they generate free radicals that can produce oxidized lipid that has better activity factor path and path like activity they then act through this g protein coupled path receptor which is expressed on various cell types and mediate several acute and systemic effects and we study their role in cancer progression and cancer therapy efficacy so we use various research tools for our bench to bed side translational studies we have a model system uh, that either express or do not express this path receptor and and we then uh, then treat these various tumor cells with or without different agents and then analyze their effects on measuring various biological parameters including the generation of path agonists microvesicular particle release as well as their effects on various signaling pathways we also use various mouse models like knockout mouse model of the path receptor and also transgenic mouse to measure the immune responses and what we basically take as a read out is that measuring tumor growth and also the efficacy of therapeutic agents we also take advantage of the human studies to define their translation relevance and for that we utilize various tumor tissues and blood and serum samples from pre and post chemotherapy treated cancer patients and these various projects are ongoing in my lab and we have also been exploring uh, the effects of path receptor on micro and these projects are being done in collaboration with faculty colleagues including dr jeffrey b travers as far as my academic teaching goes i've been involved in teaching effective scientific writing part 1 and part 2 that's been designed for leader and mid track students and i teach various topics on cancer pharmacology and therapeutics i've also been teaching thesis development workshop with another faculty colleague dr yon jisu and we teach the students how to design a working hypothesis or research tools to be used and how to interpret the research findings and overcome any any flaws or limitations i've also been teaching integrative pharmacology and toxicology which is directed by dr jibel and i here i teach various cancer models and then i also teach overview of animal research which is being directed by dr imli dudley and here i give a broad perspective of various mouse model is being used for skin cancer research so um i hope you would be very interested in joining our department and also taking advantage of several courses that that the department offered uh and also taking advantage of our interesting research project i have had two master students who are graduated this uh, spring semester so thank you very much uh, and if you have any questions you can directly email me or check uh, the faculty website hi my name is michael kemp i'm an assistant <laughs> That's just a few of our faculty. We have quite a few more. So um, if you want to learn more, go to our websites and ask. Um, that's it. I'm ready to answer any questions you have. If you, um, if you want to email me, my email address is my name, Terry, T-E-R-R-Y dot o r o s z i at right dot edu that is w r i g h t dot edu so that's me email me if you have any questions otherwise i'm going to end this video here you've been listening to me long enough and i hope to meet you all someday